I'm Dr. Cherie. I've wanted to be a doctor ever since I was two. I was once the victim of cancer, heart disease, and depression. I was in a battle for my life, physically and emotionally, and almost defeated. My battle with breast cancer has left me physically disabled by lymphedema. You thought I was trying to pull a Michael Jackson. But today, I am a victor, a fighter, a winner. Through my time of chaos, uncertainty, and despair, there were three people in particular whose lives set an example for me. First, there's Kathy Marcos, who I will call finally fabulous at 50. She was an emergency trauma department registered nurse, working long and grueling hours and eating fast food. At the age of 43, she developed heart pain and chest pain and had to undergo a heart catheterization. She described herself as fat and tired all the time, and she didn't like how she looked. She decided she needed to jumpstart her body, her life, and her eating habits before it was too late. Once she started, she knew there was no going back. Her journey began when she decided to join a gym, but three years later, at still 165 pounds and a whopping 40% body fat, she decided to get serious about her physique. She wanted a form where she could display her hard work, dedication, and bring to the stage the concept that we, especially women in our 40s and 50s, can get in shape, stay fit, and the notion that it is never too late to begin. Where does her motivation come from? Simply put, she said, I'm motivated by fear of big butt syndrome and thunder thighs. In other words, I don't want a fat behind coming in the door five minutes after me. Bodybuilding has become the passion of her life and drives her to push on to the next competition, knowing that she is the one controlling the changes her body is going through in every aspect and way. Kathy was moved by her passion and the desire to be an example to women at large. Looking at Kathy's life, there were so many parallels between us. Both fast-paced healthcare professionals in our 40s, dissatisfied with our appearance and newly diagnosed heart disease. Although mine was diagnosed while I was going through chemotherapy and was determined to be congenital and out of my control, it was life-threatening, and there were steps that I could take that could prolong my life. Seeing myself as a winner was imperative, which allowed me to gather the courage and strength that compelled the fighting spirit needed. Certainly, I had other choices in that moment. It has been said that our lives are the sum of our fears. The decisions made by us daily are what helps us get to where we want to be, moving us from where we are or experiencing no change at all. I think we've all found that in order to evolve or improve, we must choose not to relinquish our power to misperceptions, fear, painful situations, or people. Nothing can get in your way or prevent you from reaching your goal without your permission. Next, there's William Wilson, who I will call stupor to stupendous. He was born in the middle of a snowstorm and behind the bar of his grandparents' hotel. This inauspicious but curiously suggestive birth would produce the man who decades later both Time and Life magazines would honor as one of the most influential figures of the 20th century. His parents divorced, and the, the divorce led to feelings of abandonment and started a series of depressions he would face throughout his life. He quickly took to alcohol in an attempt to cope with his life issues. Bill failed to graduate law school because he was too drunk to pick up his diploma. And although he had success as a stock speculator, his constant drinking made business impossible and ruined his reputation. At the age of 38, he was committed to the Charles B. Towns Hospital for Drug and Alcohol Addictions, where he was eventually told that he would either die from his alcoholism or have to be permanently locked up. He descended into chronic and desperate alcoholism. Considered by himself and others to be hopeless, he was visited by his old friend, Ebby, who Bill knew to be a severe alcoholic, but who was miraculously sober. Although Bill's drinking continued, Ebby's visit opened an avenue of the possibility of sobriety. One month later, Bill's life was utterly changed by a transforming spiritual experience that resulted in his never needing to take another drink of alcohol for the rest of his life. Bill joined the Oxford Group, and along with Dr. Robert Smith, an alcoholic Oxford Group member, began working with other alcoholics. They had success helping alcoholics in what they called a nameless squad of drunks, which would later be named Alcoholics Anonymous. As many of you know, Alcoholics Anonymous originally put forth a 12-step program as a set of guiding principles outlining a course of recovery from addiction and compulsion and other behavioral problems. Step four particularly resonates with me, and it is this. 
made a fearful and searching moral inventory of ourselves. Although alcohol was never my coping mechanism, I have my own vices for trying to deal with my depression, as likely many of you have, working incessantly, trying to be all things to all people, and pushing myself to limits that were never meant for me to reach. Like Bill, I think we've all learned that in order to move forward, there has to be a paradigm shift in looking at past, present, and future options. Struggles have a way of bringing us to the point where we are forced to consider what we still have rather than what we've lost in order to bring a new vision or path into view. We are forced to recreate, dare I say driven, to recreate purpose for our lives. This recreation allows us to overcome our struggles by breathing new life into dying hope. Bill's disparaging life was abruptly and unexpectedly changed and led to the creation of an organization where millions have received life-saving help. Here's our chance to ask what lessons can be learned and how what we are experiencing will enable us to be a blessing to others. Often it is through you that others find the strength to face their challenges. We were born and we were made to overcome our challenges by breathing new life into dying hope. Lastly, there is Yvonne Springs, who I will call Miss Poverty to Miss Policy. She was born in Sharon, Mississippi, great-grandchild of slaves, married at 15, first child at 16. She was a high school dropout because family came first. She endured repeated domestic violence, but for fear of the lives of her children, didn't run until they were safely tucked away. By the age of 26, she had four children and had remarried. Although her life was ahead of her, she was living for her children. Wanting to be an example to her two daughters and two sons, she would not allow other societal role models to set the paths for her children. Yvonne repurposed her life. Five years after her last child was born, she received her GED and scored within the top 5% of all people who had ever taken the test since it started. She received straight A's in all classes, leading to an associate's degree, and went on to become one of the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's leading systemic investigators. Yvonne decided to live in her own power. I was fascinated by her tenacity and incentivized by her actions for two reasons. I, too, have two daughters and was a single parent after a failed marriage. None of us want our children to see our life as a failure. But you're not a failure because you try something and it doesn't work out. You fail only when you stop trying. Secondly, Yvonne is my mom. She died while I was going through chemotherapy, and I truly believe that if I don't give life my all, she will rise up, come and find me, and knock some sense into me. <laughs> when we examine why we hesitate or avoid facing challenges, we would have to admit that fear is what stands in our way. It seems that life always has its way of bringing us to a place where we need to make a fresh start. Some of you might be there right now. Maybe you want to break a bad habit or revive a lost dream. Maybe you want to get a handle on your finances, start your own business, write a book, whatever it is. Maybe it's your time to get started right now. This could be your new beginning. Your time to get up and get on with your dream, your vision, your assignment, your life, because it belongs to you. On our journey in life, we have to be comfortable with uncertainty and improvisation. When that happens, you will live wisely and well, not in spite of your troublesome journey, but because of it. We were born to become ourselves by creating the experiences we live. Kathy, Bill, and Yvonne are all examples of people whose lives have unfolded in an unconventional way, beyond societal expectations. They each embrace new chapters in their lives and can teach us important life lessons. Refuse to live in fear and in a state of indecision. Be willing to take action and live in the present and hope in your future. None of us were made for easy. Being alive entails more than just mere existence. The human existence is paradoxically so frail and yet so powerful. Hooking into that power is what allows us to turn struggles into triumphs bring visions into existence and dreams into reality. My challenges in life cause me to stray off course, but baby, I'm back. But for me, when I say that I'm back, I'm not referring to any state of being where I once was. I say that I'm back to the person that I was born to be but never was. I was born to be exceptional but lived in mediocrity. 
I'm back to the person that I was meant to be, which is a beacon of hope, but never was because I was hiding in the shadow of someone else's light. I'm back to fulfill the purpose that was always intended for me. And that, my friends, simply is to live. I learned that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. I'm Dr. Cherie, and my prescription for life is to live, to love yourself and others, to inspire those around you, to voice your dreams and ambitions, and finally, to enjoy life. Thank you.